everyone, I'm Ishika. And I'm Akshay. The thing about wildlife is anyone can fall in love with it through science, photography, literature, or innocent observation. Sharing their love today is Dr. Narayan Sharma, a primatologist and assistant professor at Cotton University, Guwahati. So welcome Narayanda, it's wonderful to have you here on the podcast. Uh, welcome to The Thing About Wildlife. And today we have with us someone very special who uh, has studied primates for a large part of his uh, career and he's going to tell us a lot about it today. So just a brief introduction to Narayanda. Uh, he studies community and behavioral ecology and also the conservation biology of primates in the landscape of Upper Brahmaputra Valley in Northeast India. He's also interested in political, human and landscape ecology and is also well-versed in the ecological history of that landscape. And uh, more recently, he's also been involved with teaching environmental biology and wildlife sciences at Cotton College in Guwahati. So he's somebody who's done a wide array of things. And today we're going to try and tease apart some of this and see how a single person could possibly do so many things all at once. Uh, so welcome, Narayanda. Thanks so much for being here with us. We're very excited to speak with you. Thank you so much, Jessica, for... Uh inviting me and giving me this opportunity to share some of my experience with you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Narendra. Um, and we're looking forward to this conversation. I think let's begin probably at uh, the beginning. So uh, interestingly, you have uh, always, it seems to be career-wise, interested in zoology and animals. You have a bachelor's in zoology and master's and a PhD. Uh, but what are your earliest inspirations? Like wh uh, what about uh, if you go back to your childhood, uh, is, there a, is there a point you can pinpoint and say, okay, this is where your interest in wildlife and, and nature got cemented? Yeah. So uh, I think uh, the love for biology was very early. So I think uh, I, if I remember correctly, so I think uh, it's from the class five. So uh, biology in particular and uh, science in general. So I think I was always, uh, always interested in uh, biology and science. Uh, and uh, I, I still remember a class where we used to uh, read about uh, different kind of root system. So, so we used to call it lumbar jara and gucha jara. So like, like a long, long roots and uh, clumped roots. And I think that I, I vividly remember that one, the uh, pictures and the, why there are some roots which are elongated and why there are roots which are, say, um, uh, clumped. So I think uh, that uh, from the very early stage only, so I think uh, I was very, very uh, drawn towards science, uh, not too much towards maths, uh, but science. And very interestingly, I was also interested in history and uh, 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 social science. So that's a, that, that, that's a very interesting thing that, uh, that though I was on science, but I, I also love history and the social science. And in fact, uh, in my class 10, uh, so I had to opt between uh, advanced mathematics and the history. So I took history. And uh, uh, and in fact, I, I really enjoyed learning history. At that time, uh, there was a, uh, a special uh, topic on the history of Ahom Kingdom. So I studied that. And I think uh, that actually was the seed of uh, my love for history in general also, I think it's, it's much, much earlier along with uh, science. Um, uh, right, uh, like, a, so we we were uh, in, uh, our house was outskirt of Guwahati city and uh, there was a lot of nature. So I, re I remember that we hardly uh, used to stay at home. So we used to room around the uh, uh, this, uh, mountains. There were small, small hillocks. So we used to go there. We used to go for a track. We used to go for to still uh, say mangoes. So whatever that a, a child, a child possibly could do, I think we did it. So me and with uh, along with my friends. So I think the connection with nature was there in a very, very early time. So we never, I, I, I never realized that I was at home for a long, long time. I got so many uh, like a bashing because I was not at home because I was keep moving, uh, keep going to different places. 
but uh, but it's a like uh, there are uh, the, you may find the people who were very much interested in say birds or say animals uh, from initial period so i think i don't remember that uh, uh, in the earlier period i used to uh, just enjoy nature so rather than uh, going into detail about say why the what kind of, uh, what insect is eating or what the bird looks like but rather than look experiencing the whole landscape so i think i, I had a interest uh, in the, in that kind of thing uh, from the initial period i used to i really love travel so i remember that um, used to go hiking in this uh, small hillocks and uh, on the top of the mountain from the uh, these are not uh, very 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 tall uh, hillocks but uh, from the top we used to say guwahati at that point of time and we used to have this uh, berries and uh, chill out there and come back uh, at the evening time and just to uh, get again trust by my parents so so from the initial time i was a kind of a just a outward kind of person so i i i never re- uh, remember uh, reading for a long long time but i think uh, uh, but uh, i used to go uh, to school regularly and attend classes i think uh, that i i never compromised during my uh, from my uh, initial period till uh my uh, master's degree so mm-hmm. the cla- attending class was a very very integral for me so i, I really wanted to always go to a class in fact uh, i i re- remember that i used to cry to go to school so when my sister <laughs> sister was uh, going to school so i was very small so i i used to like a fight with uh, um, <clears throat> my mother and father to go to school so i think that was uh, the education was there i guess from the very very early time and uh, nature i think uh, as, I, as i told you my uh, inspiration uh, was mostly from the landscape uh, in and around me so there is no particular person if i remember from or from the childhood but later on i i come to know about a lot of people who inspired me but uh, initial period i think just used to love the nature and walk around that's really so nice that you know even your schooling had such a large impact on who you've become and the fact that it added to your love for the landscape i think very few people managed to take away so much positiveness from you know school education and even remember things like diagrams i think but you know if the fact that you could remember a couple of things so vividly i think is also testament to maybe how your teachers interacted with you i'm sure you are that person for many of your students now as well <laughs> hopefully <laughs> um so so how did you come to study primates why why primates okay so uh, <clears throat> then uh, i cleared uh, my uh, uh, metric exam and i had a i had two choice because i thought that i did very bad in uh, my matriculation because i remember playing cricket just 15 days before uh, the exam and suddenly someone asked me when is your exam then we realized that this this exam is just 15 days later so i remember running to my home me and my friend and uh, this 15 days i think were very very intense reading and uh, we we gave exam and uh, we thought like we'll we'll pass with the third division or second division and i was already started preparing uh, because i'm not going to uh, i'll not get uh, seat in science college Uh, so i started reading my brother uh, was uh, brother's note uh, books the political science and i i think i read half of them at that time i thought i would just go to the arts but um, but suddenly uh, the, during the uh, say result day so we start from looking from the third division till the second division and, and our name was not not there me and my friend and we were really disappointed and suddenly we said let's uh, let's look at the first division so it was like unlikely possibility and there we we saw our name so so that first division came and that also paved me to uh, choose science uh, and i was always fascinated by uh, biology so i took biology and uh, so there is uh, mathematics was alternative okay so mathematics was alternative so uh, we gave very i, I did a very step motherly behavior towards mathematics so i was focusing only on the bio, biology uh, and accordingly i got mark so i got like some uh, double the mark uh, what i got in mathematics but i passed so in mathematics so that was the uh, important thing that i passed the mathematics and uh, after that i think uh, one cl- then i then i had a cho- choice of either going for say, chemistry and physics and bi- uh, geology or botany uh, 
So I uh, took admission in, uh, in one college uh, where my major was supposed to be in chemistry. Then in another college where I took uh, admission, where I got admission actually, and where I got a, a major in geology. So then uh, there, are, there are no question of going to chemistry because mathematics is all, already there. Uh, so it's uh, I need to really get rid of mathematics. So I said, no, I think I love uh, um, geology, not, not even the botany at that point of time. Then I took botany and one particular class, uh, I remember uh, in, during BSc, uh, second year. So there is a topic called uh, the primate behavior. So one of the teacher, I still remember that class, uh, Dr. Sunan Bordoloi uh, in Biborwa College. So he taught that uh, beha uh, behavior of primates. And I think that was the day, I think I, I can say that the turning point uh, why I started loving primates. So I completely hooked to that, uh, that class. And uh, then there was an Indo-US primate project. So I, I went to, uh, says Dr. Sunan Bordolis, sir. I said, I'm really interested in, uh, say, looking at uh, primate behavior. He said, why don't you go and meet a scientist of Indo-US primate project? Uh, their office was uh, somewhere in uh, Maligam, Guwahati. So I went there and spoke to them. And I think that is the turning point. Uh, I thought, no, I think I need to study primate because the behavior was so, so fascinating. So all their social ranking, all their mating system. And uh, I think it also also uh, depends on the teacher who is teaching you. Otherwise, I think if uh, instead of Sunan and Sir, if somebody uh, else would have taught me behavior like that, I don't think I would have uh, gone for that. So I think there are certain teachers who really influence you. So, so Sunan and Sir never studied behavior. So he was an entomologist. But I think the way he taught us, so along with the primate behavior, there was a bee behavior. Bee behavior. I still remember the uh, bee dance, that uh, round dance and the tail, tail waggling dance. That completely fascinated me. And uh, I went and uh, uh, took admission for the master's in uh, uh, Guwahati University. Uh, the, my first intention was to study uh, animal ecology, wildlife biology, and do dissertation on primates. So I think I, I was the rather, I think uh, one of the few students who had a very uh, focused, uh, uh, so what I wanted to do the, after my master's. So when I, when I took master's. So I think uh, that, uh, that day and this day, I think uh, uh, rest is like all love for primates, but I deviate a little bit here and there. I also worked on uh, elephants and there are a lot of other things as, as you said, and I recently I started working on birds also, but uh, primates is that like if if you if you uh, call them a vertebrate and this is the vertebra. So along with I have the different ribs of different uh, say uh, studies. Yeah, yeah, that's a very interesting and uh, uh, solid uh, motivation. I think uh, very inspiring. I'm sure for you, definitely your students who will come to soon and us definitely and our listeners. And I think one other vertebra, parallel vertebra uh, uh, that we can see in your work is uh, your focus uh, region. Uh, even though you've worked in other parts of India, in, in Karnataka on elephants and things like that, a lot of your work across taxa from forests to birds and of course primates. On the eastern of the valley. Uh, what is it about the place? I mean, it definitely uh, for someone who doesn't know of it and just looks for primates in the world, it definitely has very high diversity. Is that uh, what brought you there or was it a personal connection uh, that you already mentioned about uh, with your interest in history and all of that? Yeah, I think there are, there are a lot of things uh, that uh, about Northeast India and, and my personal preference of uh, Northeast. I think first of all, um, though I was interested in the process or the say, pattern based ecology, uh, but uh, I think uh, I, I, I'm in love with Assam. So, so I think uh, I cannot visualize myself uh, working in say, forest of Borneo or uh, say, uh, uh, say in Amazon. So I, uh, if, 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 even if I, if I would have um, got chance. So even not, not in uh, Western Ghat, because I think uh, what uh, sets this particular region apart from the rest of the country, uh, I think it's, it's a personal preference. So first of all, um, I'm born and brought up here. So 
So there is a, something called the sense of place. I think uh, you, you must have heard about this particular term. So I think we are very, very attached to the place where we uh, grow and uh, where, because we tend to come to those places wherever you go. So it's uh, so coming back to Assam uh, after my uh, postdoc was was a decision that uh, that was very easy for me rather than going abroad to do my second postdoc. So when I got an opportunity to come to Assam, I I, I think that's a uh, I never gave a second thought because I really want to come to this place to work and um, uh, and because we I'm I'm very very attached to this region. So I think uh, if you can. Uh, so with that I was telling, so even within Assam, so I was most attached to the upper Brahmaputra Valley rather than the say lower uh, Assam or say Manas and all those areas. So if you ask me, I can, I can visualize the entire valley. So I don't know, maybe thousands time, maybe more than uh, 1000 time I have looked at the Google, um, Google Earth map. So I can visualize the entire landscape in my mind. Uh, I think that that comes from a very uh, huge attachment to the landscape. And uh, when I when I cross Kajiranga, so I, I maybe very very uh, maybe maybe uh, offend many people, but uh, when I'm in Kajiranga, I'm thinking about Upper Assam. So <laughs> so uh, I know that Kajiranga has its own beauty, but uh, I think there are certain personal biases. Uh, I I'm not able to explain why why it is so. But as soon as I like, cross Kajiranga, I think I feel home, uh, and uh, I think I I reach to my place. So uh, the Upper Assam has that uh, appeal for me. I think, and uh, it's very difficult to explain in in terms of words. So why that particular uh, place is so appealing, and uh, possibly what happened like uh, my uh, initial exp exposure. I think, I think there was something to uh, do with the imprinting. Uh, so I, I don't know if it, uh, uh, so you remember the, the, there's something called the imprinting. So whichever things you saw first, you uh, start realizing that, okay, that is the, the, the famous uh, walk on behavior. So if, uh, they start, the uh, ducks start chasing. The... So I think that my first exposure to primates was also also in Northeast, like also in Upper Assam. So maybe I think the first imprint, and that too with uh, none other than uh, Dr. Aninde Sina uh, by, uh, next to me. So you know how much he can influence you. So we actually were the one of the fortunate people to spend almost one month with him in the field. So he was that uh, free at that point of time. But now I think one minute is very difficult to get. So it's uh, to just to talk to him. So it, I think that has also, I think, uh, uh, put a very solid platform. So, and I, when I looked at those forests, when I looked at those primates and looked at the landscape, I thought, this is my place. This is, this is where I, I really wanted to spend the rest of my life. So even I went and, uh, to Western Ghat uh, and uh, say Valparai and looked at uh, lion-tailed macaques and all. I think I never felt that uh, connection with uh, the landscape. Okay, but the, maybe the maybe science is very different. Science-wise, I am always excited, be it in the Brazil or be it in say Borneo, everywhere. I think I love the science part, but I, I think the uh, choose when it comes to choosing the why northeast, uh, I think this may be the early exposure. And uh, and I think uh, after that I never look back. And that too on the primates. So if you ask me right now to choose between say elephant and the primate, I will again go for primates. Wow, that's a that's a uh, that's an answer. I think uh, we'll hear in very different flavors, but the same uh, sense of place uh, connection. Uh, with we have heard in the guests in the past, and I think we will in the future as well. So thank you for that. <laughs> I think it's, uh, you know, it's also so important for researchers to allow themselves to be drawn to a landscape, even in a slightly undescribable way, because it's so easy to think that your science has to drive everything and it you just need to find the perfect system for your question. But it's important, I think, like you were saying, to return to a place where you feel at home and you feel like working and conserving and I think that's that's something we should also learn and not, you know, blame ourselves for being drawn to certain places. I think that's just human yeah, nature. I think, <laughs> I think we should not feel guilty of not uh, not going to say not uh, working on some pressing needs because I think we have. Uh, I think if you go, 
so that's why I I never enforce uh, my student to follow a certain path. I think you you chart your own path, whatever suits you. So if you if it's uh, if you if you if you after the masters, I do not want all of you to be wildlife biologists. I want some of you to be a, a civil servant, so that but go to a civil servant or join a civil servant with with an ecological literacy. So you know that uh, okay, this is the thing uh, that I learned during my masters. So if I can make some difference uh, using my position as a civil servant, or maybe an actor, or maybe a singer, maybe a painter. So I think uh, so. So that is also important to to listen to your heart and follow the path. Not like a uh, someone is telling you or some there are some bigger question that you need to answer. So if that question not appealing you, however bigger question it is, I think it's it's not worth to go for that. I think uh, you need to enjoy the study and you need to really enjoy what you are doing. Then only then it become uh, I think just uh, uh, your your habit. Of uh, working, so work. There is nothing called work at that time. So you you enjoy everything that you are doing. So I think that uh, I realize. Yeah. No, I think that's that's so important. Yeah. And actually, that you know also brings me to asking you. Uh, you know, you've spent like you said so much of your childhood just exploring and experiencing the landscape and just living with it. So was it any different for you to be in that same landscape? now as a scientist or a researcher rather than someone who's just part of the system like was that did it did the landscape change for you in any way when it became part of your professional life the i think the love has hasn't changed the feelings has changed actually so love is still there maybe the feelings there is a little bit changed but i it it gives me uh, it's really pain when i when i see this so i i remember like uh, looking at the same landscape uh, after say 30 years when i when i came from bangalore or i think that i start there were tears in my eyes because i saw the degradation of that landscape it's a beyond recognition so i i remember okay there was our uh, this tree there was this tree that's gone this gone and that gone so i think that the loss is uh, uh, it's a very very melancholy you know like when you go to that particular place and it it gives you that sad sadness uh, so it It's a, it's a, I, I don't know if it is a true love and there is a true sadness. I think I, I get the true, true sadness when I look at uh, those landscape completely changed in some unrecognizable uh, features. So I think, uh, yeah, I think that's a, that's how it uh, uh, should. Uh, I think that's a, that's kind of a normal thing to do. But I think I cannot fathom uh, the fact that that particular thing is not there. So I still that child. Again, relieve those movement, but uh, I'm, I'm, I know that this is not uh, that easy to do. But uh, I think that uh, gives that sadness. So, and uh, I know that I need to live with this sadness throughout my life. So I cannot get back that landscape again. So it's completely changed. So, uh, so having said this, I think um, maybe that was my say uh, <clears throat> uh, say reference point. But uh, if you look at this, I think uh, you will also uh, realize that maybe our forefather also felt the same kind of thing when things changed, when the road came. Uh, because I think it's uh, generation after generation. Maybe my daughter, when she will, she will grow up, she will uh, see this landscape, and then uh, say thirty years later, she will have a, encounter a completely new kind of landscape. So I think this is part and parcel of people. So if you are if you are close, if you are very very Attached to uh, a land and uh, the landscape, I think you will feel that pain, that that inevitable. Wow! Yeah, that is uh, <laughs> truly some words to think about. Uh, I, and when you were saying this, I remember I just thought of it, uh, Narendra. You as a teacher uh, who is involved so closely with uh, mentoring. Young students who will put some of whom might follow your path, and like you mentioned, some of whom may. have this ethic in whichever path they follow and you say this is inevitable so is that something that uh, you th- you think you discuss with your students uh, these kind of uh, emotional issues associate with the work that you do yes definitely i think we, uh, as a teacher i need i think we need to be very honest so uh, whatever you are i think uh, you cannot uh, you cannot uh, be uh, say 
uh, you cannot put those uh, false masks for a long time, you know, like, uh, like, oh, no, I know everything or I think you need to be vulnerable. So whatever you know, I think there are there are many, many uh, topics that I do not know. So it's it, it's always OK to be, uh, say, uh, uh, say, express your vulnerability. I think then only you will be you will be able to blend with your students. I think you will be part of that learning system. So then otherwise, what happened? Then you are a teacher and you are students, and that's it. So there is no learning environment. So what what I really think is that you should also. I I, I still remember a talk. Uh, I forgot uh, that was delivered at, at CCS. Someone asked a person, how how were you able to blend with the, uh, the local tribal people there? So he said that uh, I just make myself vulnerable. So I'm not someone who is like a, say, uh, say, uh, <clears throat> say, uh, I'm a very macho person. Nothing will happen to me. So I came from this uh, uh, place, and I have like there is a financial stability. Everything I have, I'm a perfect person. So if you do you portray like, uh, if you portray that image, I think you'll not be a part of that system. So I think what uh, I do is like a, I'll, uh, whatever, whoever I am, you know, I just uh, portray them. So my vulnerability, my strength, my weakness, every, everything, my student know everything about it. And sometimes my anger also towards certain person. So uh, though I know like uh, you, you should not uh, talk about this, but uh, I we discuss about these things. So what I feel for, for a particular person, what I feel about particular issues, though these are not part of the curriculum, uh, so I think they they should know you as a teacher, um, uh, who you are, or, or mentor. Uh, if you do that, I think you, you should you should, uh, you should discuss about everything. So I know there are many students who uh, actually uh, when I when I doing uh, start doing this, many students start coming and uh, talking about the problem that they are facing. So I made facilitate that. Uh, channel. I think I opened that channel so that they can come and talk. So what's wrong with them? So one of the students came and he said, sir, wildlife biology is not my cup of tea. I said, perfectly fine. Oh, so what, what do you want to do? He said, I want to do some business. Please go ahead. And he quit and he went. And we still are good friends. So he, wherever uh, I meet, meet him. So I, I said, how are you doing? He said, I'm doing perfectly fine. And that is what I wanted to see you. I do not want to see you like uh, uh, taking wildlife and uh, crying the rest of your life. I think uh, not all people are, uh, say, made for uh, a particular type, but you are made for that particular job. I think if that is giving you immense uh, uh, happiness, and if you think you are satisfied, you are content, you are contributing something, Please go ahead to that. I think we need to make ourselves a little bit vulnerable. So it's not like a deliberate, but uh, uh, let it come naturally. So do not hide, uh, do not portray a very false picture of you become a very uh, no, uh, known to all. So I, I said, I do not know many, many uh, equations. So let's let discuss it. Please tell me how to, how to solve this equation. So I think if that happened, then learning become a collective uh, activity rather than just uh, say one way channel. So me, me telling and the student learning and the student listening and going and forgetting it. So I think this should also have a long-term impact to students. I think, you know, one thing that's so striking is you just become so incredibly passionate about teaching and mentoring so many students. And, uh, you know, Akshay and I both had the, you know, privilege of seeing you with your students when you visited uh, the Andamans field base for one of your field trips. And, you know, it was just so apparent to us how much your students doted on you and looked up to you as well. And, you know, clearly you've given it your all being part of the, you know, master's program at Cotton's College and, you know, really putting a lot of yourself into it. So um, considering you've played such an integral role there, you know, what is it that pushed you towards teaching and wanting to play such a large role in the education side of this field? And what has that been like for you? Like this is, I mean, from what we know, this happened in 2016. Mm -hmm. And so, and it's become a large part of yeah. what you do now. I think it's a, always a challenge here because uh, it's not a traditional university or it's unlike say NCBS masters or WIM masters or other, other places where uh, the focus is mostly on the wildlife. So we need to, uh, uh, there is an environmental science uh, 
part of this course and also the wildlife part. So I'll take uh, what uh, I focus on the wildlife uh, mm -hmm. part. Uh, and there is a lot of challenges here. So when you designed this study, we thought uh, we'll synthesize uh, these two fields. Uh, but uh, so we are still uh, figuring out how to this synthesize this two field because we need someone who can uh, who has a very good understanding of environmental biology as well as the wildlife biology and then we can make a like a one uh, unique discipline so that was the idea uh, and we are still working on that how to do it so it's we're still not figuring uh, out but uh, there are certain uh, projects that uh, my master's student did uh, those are reflecting that uh, uh, it's possible to blend environmental biology and the wildlife sciences and come out with some certain work which are very unique in nature. For example, if you, if you wanted to work on, say, toxicology uh, and looking at the impact of toxicology on, say, reproductive uh, fitness, I think that uh, breeds this gap of environmental biology and the wildlife sciences. So I think that's, uh, that's an interesting development that we are uh, thinking. Uh, having said this, I think the challenge is too much here. Uh, so uh, I'm the uh, only single faculty so far, uh, uh, the permanent fa faculty, but though there are a lot of uh, guest faculties that teach. So there are advantages and disadvantages of this one. So I'm, since I'm the uh, single faculty, um, so initially it uh, become a, uh, difficult because I need to read then uh, the most dreaded uh, thing called mathematics. So, because you, uh, however, uh, so uh, you try to run away from mathematics, mathematics will never leave you. Okay. So, I need to uh, make peace with uh, mathematics and the statistics. So, I think uh, uh, even I, I did that in my uh, PhD, and slowly I started loving statistics and mathematics. So, now the mathematics and statistics is also an integral part of uh, our course. The design was design was uh, why is the course reflect uh, like uh, I uh, one of my student used to tell so sir give us buffet of different topics so within that uh, they, they say uh, environmental uh, so uh, wildlife sciences we I give buffet so there is a population ecology conservation uh, say uh, conservation biology community ecology then there is also art and uh, science of natural history which is a which I, I don't think nobody teach. So, uh, so we have we take 16 classes of this arts and science of natural history for the first semester. When they come to the university, we, we teach them how to appreciate nature. So, and and again, I think that's uh, that maybe coming out of my childhood fascination, fascination of because I think if that would not have been there, so my attachment towards the landscape would not be so strong. So I think we also try to uh, tell them, and I pull faculties from different uh, departments. For example, there is a faculty who teach, uh, say, uh, identification skills of uh, insect because I am not able to uh, take that class, right? And there are uh, faculty who teach fish identification. There are faculty who teach uh, herpetofauna. There are faculty who teach geology because geology is also, also very important. So this is a very, very different kind of uh, syllabus that we design. So uh, I try to make, uh, say, a student at least appreciate the uh, interdisciplinary nature of the wildlife because I think wildlife is one, one department. I think all of you agree that it's a interdisciplinary, right? Right from the uh, human management, I think we have to go from the human management till the policy level. Then there is a political, uh, uh, say, ecology. Then there is a historical ecology. There is a human ecology. Then there is an urban, urban ecology. And in between all the uh, typical, say, habitat ecology and uh, other stuff. And also, I try to give more emphasis on the study design because asking questions, so how will you do this? And uh, one more uh, thing that I started and uh, very inspired by J5. Uh, was the soft skill. So, uh, so I take opportunity whenever uh, there is some, uh, uh, say, uh, time uh, to discuss, say, how to present. So how to make presentations, how to write emails, because here, so unlike uh, other parts, so people write email, entire email in the subject body. Okay. So there is no subject line, there is no uh, proper salutation. So the soft skill development during master's is also very, very integral. 
and i'm also teaching uh, in ba in liberal arts so it's it's a new course so i'm teaching wildlife sciences so i'm fascinated by the students engagement there the ba liberal arts so these people do not have science background but they have a arts background and they are they're quite amazing so i think uh, i need to put more extra effort to uh, say uh, de jargonizing science and talking to them to to their level and uh, so we we have done now started the gender studies pg uh, diploma in gender studies so where i'll be talking about the role of gender in biodiversity so uh, so these are some of the in uh, within university uh, courses but i'm taking a lot of classes uh, elsewhere so through online because online is made so much uh, uh, give us so much opportunity to reach to each and every corner of say assam or say in any any part of the world so i'm taking this opportunity to reach to people say in very remote part where i cannot go physically but i can at least uh, give a presentations about wildlife biodiversity and the conservation biology so during the lockdown period so i i opened that window to reach to students or reach to the institutions which are not uh, able to get that kind of proper exposure to uh, say wildlife and ecology and other part and uh, apart from that also i invite lot of um, Uh, resource persons to come and interact so i fondly remember uh, professor amitab joshi he came interacted with uh, our students and that has a impact on the students so students are thinking okay this is the person who uh, like uh, they revered like uh, okay professor amitab joshi the one of the finest population uh, biologist so so this person come and talk with you and that has a very very different uh, impact in them and i think they are more confident students are more confident they they think they are more empowered and uh, uh, when they ask questions so these are the people who really uh, take those questions very seriously they will not say okay this is a silly question or you do not know so one of them is uh, say uh, uh, amitab joshi as i told you dr anindesh sina who also came here and in that lot of people wherever they are uh, passing through guwahati so so my a bait is that uh, please come and teach or take a uh, give a talk i'll i'll uh, feed you asam isthali so <laughs> so that is the only remuneration they get uh, uh, when whenever they pass through guwahati and all my, all of my friends uh, so uh, so whom i can uh, reach to any time so for example rohit taniwadi kar dr rohit taniwadi kar from nature conservation foundation is teaching plant animal in interactions so now and uh, subhanka chakravarti uh, he is teaching population genetics nisma dahal uh, uh, so she did a phd from ncbs she is teaching uh, biogeography so in a way uh, i'm trying to get best of the people so i think in a way it's just the mimicking the ncbs uh, module but uh, with very very little budget and, and only on the based on the goodwill that i i have with this people and i can reach out to these people and ask them to give a talk and uh, so this is the extra effort so i i can i can really i can easily go and teach them so teach them uh, a biogeography or say population ecology but i don't think i'll do justice because these are not the subject uh, of my forte so i may teach behavioral ecology very nicely i may teach conservation biology nicely but uh, then these are the say uh, people who can who do justice to that uh, those subjects so Uh, so i'm just uh, trying to make up the chronic uh, shortage of teachers by inviting more teachers so i think uh, so i'm taking that uh, say challenge as an opportunity and i think uh, it's it's uh, giving lot of dividend so i know that law there is a lot of th- like uh, things that you need to do you need to set a time you need to talk with uh, talk with the say uh, authorities uh, administration to allow this guest faculties so there are a lot of this uh, thing happen uh, but i think the end product is al- always a uh, uh, when when i hear that they really love this uh, module taught by the guest faculties i that give me immense pleasure and i think uh, all this hard work and all those uh, background work i think this become very meaningless and uh, very minor skills so yeah yeah we were we were just wondering like uh, you you mentioned your secret sauce and being the amazing mentor to the students uh, my follow our follow up question is what is your secret sauce to get uh, so many faculty to come and teach you and teach your students and give a full experience 
So it's a, I think a lot of goodwill and one Assamese thali, like you mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. I think no. I think uh, so. Uh, so the teach. Uh, so I think there is something called the uh, right to education, but I think I also believe in right to knowledge. So why should a person who is sitting in say very very remote part of the country should be uh, should not get the uh, the knowledge that they really want? So and then there is a technology to bridge that gap. So if someone from Bangalore, if you can to reach to say uh, students or the faculty who is in Digboy, what's wrong in that? I think uh, we need to open that channel. So I think we need to facilitate this. Uh, uh, say and this this is the people uh, I think in Bangalore or say in Delhi or even in abroad. I think there are people very very uh, open. So these are not people who are inaccessible. They they will really love if uh, they. If we approach them with a request to uh, request for a talk, I think we should we should use the technology. I think we should go beyond the right to uh, education to right to knowledge. I think if we start thinking towards that line, I think we can bridge this gap. And uh, no child, I think no students who are interested in wildlife or who are interested in asking question should be uh, say uh, like uh, should not. Just feel that I okay. I am not able to do it. So I I think that uh, is the motivation. Also another motivation for me to bring to bring the student because the, because if I remember during my entire master course I got only one seminar. Only one seminar. Can you can you believe it? Entire masters we have never read a scientific paper. Never never read a scientific paper. So that was the so uh, that was the system. in which i grew so i thought that there need to be some change and that is the change that i try to bring here so maybe this is also uh, how i what kind of education i got uh, what kind of ecological education or wild life education i got i received and i remember that i should not let my student to suffer from the same deficiencies because i remember when i went to bangalore and when i faced crowd like you um, completely knowledgeable completely hard working I I lost I completely lost. It's kind of a cultural shock to me when I went to Bangalore after my masters and when I enrolled for PhDs. So I think I did a second masters with the NCBS first batch. So uh, and and I realized that what are the things that 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 I lost during these two days two years. So uh, and because the exposure to books, the exposure to different talks. Uh, so we used to go to Etri, uh, NCBS, CES to listen to talk. wanted to we never got this opportunity so i i think that was also a kind of a um, motivation to uh, give that extra effort so that student will not deprived of uh, what they really uh, want or what they, they really deserve to i think this is just so inspiring naranda because you know you never hear people talking so much about exactly what a student takes away from the program you know it's not just about completing a syllabus or you know or having on paper said that okay we've done this but actually ensuring that a child has you know really good influences and gains a lot of knowledge and has enough inspiration to take away and do something with it i think it's it's just so incredible that you're working towards that and i i so wish that more universities uh, you know had that as their driving force and not just trying to churn out a bunch of students at the end of a year and i think yeah. like one more thing which was so um, i think true from what you mentioned uh, you know in your previous response as well was that this field is so diverse you know you can get anybody from the arts liberal sciences visual arts to be very actively involved and i think that's uh, that's one really wonderful thing about this um, you know even the field that you can get so many different people interested in looking at things from an ecological lens i think that that's uh, yeah yeah no i think i think that's uh, so uh, this national uh, education policy maybe national education policy wanted to break this barrier so i know there is a lot of uh, criticism to this but some of the things are really good about uh, one thing is about the dissolving the boundary of different uh, discipline again i can go back to my childhood where i was fascinated by both science and the history right i think uh, the seed i don't know from where that came but the, the seed of this interdisciplinarity was there uh, from the beginning 
and i think i, I all around this i, I brought that uh, idea so in fact my thesis first chapter is about the history of uh, upper assam so i i dwelt on the almost 1600 years of uh, history of uh, upper assam so at one point of time uh, my super school supervisor dr madhusudan he need to uh, stop me because i was going too deeper into it he said hey narend you have other data to analyze so you cannot just be an historian let the let the rest of this uh, be the realm of history historians let them histo historians like uh, mahesh sangrajan or arupjyoti sekya look at this so you should not go like this because that was too eng- engrossing and it's it's so fascinating you know like uh, to know that and uh, i think uh, so that is also i'm trying to bridge here so bringing different faculties from uh, cotton university to teach so there are uh, faculty from botany who are teaching there are faculty from geology who are teaching there are faculty from archaeology who are teaching now to the students so i'm giving this uh, interdisciplinarity not not now so much before the national education policy came so i started uh, from the 2016 onward and where historians come when the uh, say political ecologists come where the social scientists come and interact with uh, with the students so i think uh, we need to move uh, because the nature of the subject is like this so i think uh, we should be aware of so for example environmental laws so i can teach environmental law but if lawyer comes and uh, teach it so impact is very different right so you need to uh, so i think uh, uh, we need to give this not okay one faculty will teach one paper so i think if we go follow that uh, trend and uh, th- there may be bunch of different topics it's always good to learn d- different topics but i think you need to be in a position to say uh, say deliver that so to do justice to those topics so if we if you do not able to do justice to those topics i think we should stop teaching of uh, those those things unless we need to equip ourselves uh and train ourselves first then 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 we need to teach them so it will be uh, interesting to the students who come from uh, with a lot of hopes from this department or the uh, or the say in any department when they go i think uh, we need to give them the best and uh, it's it's a teacher it's a students uh i think who really know so, uh, so i i always think that uh, there is a uh, the teachers mostly undermine the capacity of uh, students so i think we need to we need to really think that no i think they have a limitless possibilities so i think how you are teaching uh, say a social science how you are to- te- teaching a mathematics how you are teaching statistics i think it make a lot of difference for example i remember so when uh, suhel used to teach statistics or she kavita uh, swaran used to teach statistics so it's so much easier right so it's uh, you know that wow this is this is so easy so we can we can learn it or say umes uh, when he talk about the statistics so uh, then, then we realize that it's not the subject which is difficult i think it's a, it's a teacher who made it difficult because these are teacher who are not trained enough to teach that particular subject so that that makes it more difficult i think there are certain uh, subjects which need teacher to spend some extra time making it uh, uh-huh. simple so that uh, students can understand this so i think i am striving towards that and uh, uh, as, I, so, as i told you so i am just uh, making all these uh, the adversaries into opportunities so if you if you are not if you do not have more teachers permanent teachers fine so i'll i'll invite my friends to teach so in fact uh, you'll be surprised to know that i'm also training this uh, outgoing students so we are in the fifth batch so the first batch students are all uh, now coming and teaching some of the courses so it's also the positive loop so i'm creating i'm trying to create a say cadre of uh, say trained uh, students here so uh, it's then you it become a self sufficient so then uh, the the day we stop relying on say uh, people from outside uh, so who come and teach because they are also busy in their own work i think uh, it's always not uh, so they readily agree but i know the effort they are putting it because they are compromising on other other uh, things and uh, teaching here uh, but the day we start we have a pool of students uh, who are trained enough to teach i think i think uh, my job is done so i can retire very happily with that that 
Uh, so speaking of retirement, you have a hobby and a passion that you've developed throughout, uh, which you mentioned, which is in world cinema and even acting. Uh, I read somewhere on your CV that you have acted in local plays and, your, uh, and you enjoy art and clearly you enjoy history as well, uh, right from your childhood and uh, from your, up to your PhD. Uh, and then along with that, you've also, uh, besides studying primate behavior, you've also done a lot of statistics and number crunching, that kind of uh, traditionally... Uh, you know, uh, mathy topics. Do you think you can be scientists and artists at the same time? Uh, all scientists are art, uh, artists. No way. Uh, look at uh, look at all the all the scientists. I think uh, that all of them are artists. So they they love m- listening to music. They love appreciate arts. They m- many of them are very good. Uh, say uh, singers also. So poet also. I think. Uh, this come quite naturally, you know, like uh, when you, uh, the people call it science very dry, but you can make it uh, very interesting if you, if you have a uh, artistic uh, inclination. So, so science become uh, dry uh, for me if uh, you're not, not a very artistic person. So, for example, so the presentation is skill. I think this, this is a simple thing. Just uh, if you have a, if you have a, say, uh, very dry uh, so professor. So just put some uh, three or four dry line without without putting a lot of uh, much uh, impact on say the design of this uh, slide. So so if you are if you have an artistic mind, so you start thinking what font should I use? So whether whether I should use sans serif or I should use serif so that the people will understand. So I think the the focus is on people. So. It's just like what kind of song I, I should sing, which is a mass appeal. What kind of acting would I do that is uh, that can justify the characters? So I think as a scientist also, when uh, the learning science, science maybe uh, the learning this different numbers and all those things, I think it's uh, it's uh, inevitable. So you need to do this. But how you are presenting it, I think you have a, if you have a little bit artistic inclination, I think your lectures become very very interesting. So if you listen to lectures, so you can you can borrow say uh, po- poets, you can borrow uh, movies uh, scene, or you can bring say songs to make it more interesting. So I think um, a lot of the, for example, the Gotelli, I, I remember the uh, the Gotelli who wrote this. A uh, very famous ecologist. So I think he's also a good uh, musician. He, he play play, I think, guitar or something. So there are uh, this. Uh, there are many people. I think uh, uh, Ranada. If you remember, he act. So so acting, I I stopped it long back. So I used to do it during uh, during my school time. Uh, so we used to uh, some social issues, and we to we used to. Uh, uh, so then in the states, but we also had a musical band. So we used to go and perform. So I used to sing at that point of time. And where again, my teachers were very instrumental in uh, making me singer, so-called singer. So and all those songs were on the social issues. Uh, so it's no no love songs or nothing like that. So all only on the social issues. So you need to sing this. So I think that has uh, also also impacted and uh, uh, me as a as a teacher because um, <clears throat> environmental issues when it become a social issues then you know that uh, how to how to convey this so that's why we we uh, mostly uh, now uh, working with the artists singers uh, actors so so I'm I'm trying to bring them also 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 into this uh, environmental narrative so living uh, politics besides so because they can all they can have a wide reach to the people and uh, through their songs or if they if they come in to take certain issues environmental issues it has a it is a high social ex- acceptability also so you know that now but what's going on right now so that kind of stuff but uh, i think for a scientist to be an artist i think it's, it's become very natural actually it comes uh, quite naturally. So, uh, whenever you read uh, any, uh, say, good paper or good uh, uh, book introduction, so it borrows a lot from this uh, from the science. So the science become enriched if you blend it with uh, art. Actually, so that that is what I think. Uh, 
No, I think uh, that's very true. It's just you can make things so much more interesting if you've got a, an aesthetic eye or you take the time to make it interesting for students. And I think that also comes back to you know some of the things we were saying earlier that it's not just about getting anybody who is a well-renowned uh, scientist to come and teach. It's also about finding someone who's a good speaker, who's got some charisma, who can really engage the students. Like I think sometimes even somebody who may not be an expert, but is just a wonderful uh, you know, resource person to engage with young people, they would actually end up influencing them so much Thank nicer. You. And I think that, uh, yeah, that definitely makes so much sense. Um, so I'm actually going to, uh, you know, go back a few steps and talk a little more about, uh, you know, behavioral observations and a lot of the work you've done with primates, which is, uh, you know, your first love uh, in this field. I think it's very clear now that teaching has become a very close second yeah, passion. I think so, yeah. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's so interesting because um, I think observing animals and studying their behavior is a bit of a paradox, no? Because you really... You do it because you love watching animals and being able to observe them directly. But it's also very challenging. No? It's not easy to spend those long hours trying to track them and constantly noting down what they're doing. I mean, it's, it's very easy to say that I watch monkeys, but it's not actually that simple out on field. And, you know, it's, it's a joy to watch them, but it's not as easy when you're doing trying to collect scientific data and do it systematically and you know how do you even convince the larger scientific community that this one thing i saw a monkey do is actually interesting mm. you know so um, so maybe could you just talk a bit to that and see what is it like to actually document some of these behaviors and convince people that this is important work and this is you know, worthy st of study. Yeah. <laughs> so I think uh, I just want to recall it be be before I go uh, to your question. So I remember uh, one of my very close friend, uh, Riaz, Dr. Riaz Ahmed. So he used to work on Marcos in Kashmir. Uh, so he used to say that, Are yaar, uh, do saal kaam kiya, uh, so kya nikla, ek graph. So I think, uh, <laughs> so that graph has, uh, is, you know, like, uh, so he used to show me one graph and said, this is a two years work. So I think nobody will understand the effort people put to just create that, uh, to develop that graph. I think uh, that a lot of stories behind this. I think it's uh, just a tip of an iceberg. So if, if the graph, if I wanted to borrow that phrase, the tip of the iceberg, the, the effort is below. I think just Joe Vikray, what whatever you are seeing, that graph is the, the world, hard work of two years. So same with my 22 uh, months of work, which are just uh, maybe two or three graphs. Uh, if, if I plot them in an activity budget, this would be two graphs, right? But the effort that uh, goes into it is quite immense. So there are, you are very, very right that behavioral observation is not a cup of tea, particularly when you are working in uh, a high rainfall area, okay? Uh, where uh, and the dense forest, so there are leeches uh, and there are there are downpour every uh, so almost eight months are uh, rainfall here in Upper Assam, uh, and uh, sometimes the December also uh, January also when you are not prepared for the rain then you you have rain, so I think it's, it's extremely difficult but uh, at the same time it's rewarding also the so I remember so if you, if you and and there comes the uh, there comes your um, so how much you love that particular animal or how much you love those particular questions. So these are the times I think that will really push you. Uh, so I, then, then you realize that uh, you never quit it. Okay. So I remember when I was f following stumptail macaques in Gibbon Wildlife Sanctuary. So uh, there is a, uh, there are heavy downpour from above and there are leeches. And then you need to follow the uh, stumptail and there are elephants also. Okay, so these are the, these are the different uh, things, and uh, you need to write also, right? So there are so much difficulties, but uh, what uh, pushed me to to go ahead with uh, whatever I was, was done is that to see a love of them, just to be um, with uh, Stamtel Maka. And I think one of the best thing. Uh, so I, I don't think I if I am surrounded by say all the renowned scientists of the world, I I don't think I'll be happy. 
uh, more happy there than rather than just surrounded by a lot of istanbul macaque so i think i'll, I'll prefer the istanbul macaque so for some obvious reason uh, and there is certain behavior because uh, as you said that you need long term data long term follow up from morning to evening to to get some behavior the behavior which are very rare for example even after 50 years of work on uh, say chimpanzees uh, so jen goodall so they are still finding new behavior which uh, jen goodall never found because we remember how much uh, time she spent even 50 years later they are finding new and new behavior so i think if we, if we, even if we spend all our lifetime for understanding a particular uh, primate that is not enough so i i think uh, Uh, and if you if you if even if you are with them from morning to evening i think there are certain behaviors which which appears once in a while so there is one certain uh, behavior on pictel macaque uh, and uh, sorry uh, pictel macaque and the uh, log gibbon that i found so there is a uh, there is a conception there is a people that uh, how pictel and the say uh, western log gibbon get water okay so the the usual candidate is that uh, they leak uh, water from uh, the dew uh, or say they eat fresh uh, leaves they eat uh, fresh fruits because which are abundant water so they fulfill their water need and uh, while just following this true i found that so they also uh, drink water from tree holes so so there is a tree hole and uh, there is a rain water and they will dip their hand and the gibbon uh, dip uh, dip their hand and the fingers soaked with water and then they put those fingers in their mouth this is a unique behavior that was never documented and in the, but when i uh, when i looked at uh, the literature they were not documented from uh, the old world monkeys but there were huge uh, records from new world monkeys so in fact uh, i posted that video on facebook uh, and uh, somebody said oh hey i have also seen this behavior in this species and then suddenly the numbers swelled and uh, with the seven eight uh, observation of different species then you wrote a paper uh, of all those uh, behavioral observation why they do this and the possible causes of having uh, water from those tree holes because those are the behavior people just uh, taken for granted or may not uh, have noticed it so uh, had they gone for say uh we just with the uh, say some questions uh, and uh, so that those kind of behavior would not have noticed so i think once one uh, you need to be little bit uh, say spend time uh, with these groups then only you will be able to uh, find those kind of behavior so i'm i'm very satisfied that those two behavior i think uh, we are able to uh, write a paper and uh, i also tell my student that the good to you is of uh, using facebook apart from going and liking <laughs> some celebrity <laughs> pictures you can also write papers using yeah. uh, using facebook so yeah so uh, no it's so uh, that new behavior which you saw was very fascinating in fact we had uh, you know noted it down to ask you about it because we found it so cool when we were you know going through the work you've done before mm. and uh, you know just right now uh, watching you describe how they do it you know it reminded me so much of something i've even seen the macaques in nicobar do yes. because they are so notorious for uh, you know stealing and eating coconuts and uh, you know you see some of them have such interesting ways of drinking that coconut water and uh. you know like some of them i've even seen uh, dipping their fingers in and scooping water out of the uh. of these small holes that they make in the coconuts and like you're saying it it's just fascinating because even if uh, people who live in that landscape know they do this mm-hmm. uh, it's just not at all known to the scientific community you won't find it on a google scholar search and it, it's nice that you know people write up these things and it, yes. you know, yeah i think if we have more papers like the one you put out on this interesting behavior it will also encourage other researchers to write up the observations they are seeing because Absolutely. i think it's yeah. you know when like you were saying you know time activity budgets and those sort of things you spend years mm-hmm. and months and you put one graph out and that's still most of what we see as behavioral ecology work but even documenting these very cool behaviors is an important part of it 
And well, I think I think I really believe that uh, apart from the uh, so writing this uh, say uh, scientific paper, I think researcher also should write what went behind this paper. So what uh, the kind of a uh, uh, I, I I don't know. If, uh, earlier time I think there was there is to be this something called behind the scene. So how the film was made because what are the uh, say difficulties people faced as the director faced or actor faced. I think we see the end product, not the effort that went here. I think along with this scientific paper, I think it would be really good. Uh, so if the researcher also start start share what went behind uh, writing those papers or doing that work, what are the interesting things that, that they found. I think that will really motivate the research. I think we need to be uh, that uh, I don't know if there are such uh, website uh, available or such sites available. I, I'm sure there must be, but I think it's uh, it's also the responsibility of the researcher to actually write this. I think share the, their struggle. I think most of the time we share only the uh, negative results, right? Uh, so, sorry, the positive results that that we think okay are important. So that uh, I, I just wanted to uh, recall one episode. So when I asked one of my student to do. The parasite load of uh, uh, this uh, rhesus macaque in Guwahati. So uh, she collected samples and she went to the lab, uh, this Assam Veterinary uh, <coughs> College lab, and she tested, and none of them were. Uh, uh, she didn't find parasites there, and she was panicked. Sir, I didn't find any, any say parasites there. What to do? Uh, so I said that's a reason. That's a good reason because now I think at least you can say that there is no parasite in rhesus macaque in at least one troop. No sir, no. I think this is not a good result. I said what is a good result? This is a good result. <laughs> so I need to I need to really fight with her because now I think that what what would have been important. So I, th I think there is a this preconception, no, that there's this would have like a loads of parasites, and uh, so who will publish that result? I think there is also. Uh, Say publications wise also, she was very panicked and, and uh, she said, no, I'm not going to do this work. I said, okay, I know, then, then what, what are you going to do? I said, I'll go and uh, uh, do work on say, uh, cattle in uh, Pobitora National Park and uh, whether they have parasitic growth. So I think go and find, uh, so even, even the person with whom we were collaborating in Assam Veterinary College was also very, very skeptic about this work. He said, no, no parasites, so no, no good work. But that's a good work, so if there are no parasites, so I think that's a good work. So I, I failed to actually convince her to uh, do this work actually. So, but, uh, but glad that my another students took this work. So hopefully we'll get some interesting results. Yeah, that's uh, actually you, you, you uh, encapsulated the motivation of our podcast in that answer. <laughs> I think a lot of what we, uh, what we are, especially when we talk to, uh, you know, more uh, researchers who have just finished their PhD, uh, we, I think a motivation is to get into this part of it, the negative results and the stories behind their positive and negative results yes. and what went on in them and their struggles. And speaking of struggles, I think, um, uh, we were wondering, you've also worked with conservation, uh, you, you've studied forest laws, you work closely with, uh, uh, I think before our recording, you were mentioning how uh, you are discussing with, uh, you know, you're collaborating closely with the zoo uh, in Guwahati, uh, both for education and for conservation purposes. So um, ha having been, in, uh, having one foot in academia, having one foot in teaching, and uh, while also being so connected to the landscape, uh, how do you navigate the conservation space? Because I think there people face failure a lot more and you have to, there is a lot more uh, human uh, interactions and politics that are involved. So how, how do you uh, navigate that? What is your uh, secret sauce in that uh, sector? Okay. So I think, uh, so I think these are, these are two different things. <laughs> uh, so, so most of the time I do not get fund uh, to do work. Uh, so conservation work, I think largely because they think that he's a teacher, uh, so he's teaching. So from where he will get uh, time to implement certain uh, work. Okay. So I, for example, I wanted to restore some some of the degraded area, and if I if I pitch a proposal, so I think most of the time I got rejection. I think the uh, though they do not say it explicitly in their uh, decision letter, but I get a feeling that uh, that might be a reason why people think that uh, this uh, person is not suitable, maybe 
because he's also engaged in teaching and uh, will not get uh, time to do restoration work. But I think, uh, so that's the important area, I think, uh, where uh, I need to, is, so when you are doing certain conservation work, I think you need to really spend time. So, and conservation work, I, I know it uh, witnessed more failure than successes throughout, throughout the world. And uh, there are there are many such examples. There are very few conservation success stories. Um, I think we need a lot of effort in, in there. So that's why what, what we are trying to do is uh, to work uh, in Guwahati, which is not very uh, uh, so far from my university, some of the areas which are very near to Guwahati, um, accessible very easily. So if, if I can uh, teach in the next half, I can go and do work. So, in fact, we are also doing something called the uh, Unnat Bharat Abhiyan, which is a, 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 a initiative of um, Ministry of Human Resource Development. Uh, so, we, in that program, we adopted uh, five villages, uh, which are close to uh, Cotton University. And in those villages, we are doing some, uh, uh, say, village development work. So, and uh, we strategically uh, selected some of the villages, which are, which are located next to the protected area. So where I can go and engage with the communities. So there is a the scope of doing that kind of work. Um, and uh, I think as a, as a researcher, I think we need to uh, see, uh, as an educator, I think we need to see how much time we'll be able to give to, say, uh, doing this uh, applied conservation biology. So uh, I think uh, that's a trade-off here. So because as, as you know, that teach, uh, teaching uh, demands a lot of investment in terms of time and effort. Uh, and that's not, not that easy. So uh, despite of that, what I'm saying that we're trying to do this in collaboration with somebody else. So it's not like a um, Cotton University, uh, my department or me alone is going and doing, implementing that work, which certainly need collaboration where we can uh, provide the technical uh, say know how or how to how to go about it. So uh, and uh, the science behind the work. Uh, but I think the foot shoulder should be uh, either from the university, some of the pass out students or the alumni, or maybe the from uh, the organization with whom you are collaborating. So uh, so I think this should. So this is a very very again I am saying that though it's a, a challenge, we need to explore the opportunities. So how best we can. Uh, uh, say collaborate with the government, uh, collaborate with the NGOs, uh, and uh, bring out certain uh, so say changes applied conservation. So because otherwise, what what we uh, have seen that uh, there are NGO which are mostly doing say groundwork, and there are institutions which are doing mostly the theoretical work. So I think there are there are possibility of engaging with the with the NGOs and collaborating uh, with them. Uh, and I think the, the the collaboration is is actually very very fruitful if we do it uh, in, a, in a nice way. And again, uh, I cannot go and say implement uh, many conservation uh, issues, but I can I can be part of certain uh, 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 decision making bodies where we can influence policies, where uh, where we can do the advocacy and include influence policy that can help the conservation of say, uh, fauna or their habitats. Yeah, I think that's immense uh, potential. And, and uh, as a scientist, I, I believe that we should uh, be involved actively in the advocacy as well as the policies, because that's, that's where I think we can make a huge difference. So if you are uh, part of this uh, decision making process. Thank you for that. Uh, that's actually so nice to hear a, a, a passionate yet very practical solution of how people within academia can engage uh, without losing their mind. So thank you. Yeah. So Narayanda, you've done so much, you know, over the last, you know, couple of, uh, you know, ever since your master's and, you know, during this time you, you studied primates, you've looked at elephants, you've looked at behavioral ecology, distributions, population, diet, of course, a lot of the conservation issues and even some policy work, which you were just telling us about. What has, what have you personally enjoyed the most, you know, from all these several aspects of work? Like, do you have a favorite or do you feel like you need to do all of it to, uh, to really <laughs> enjoy what you're doing? 
I think it's uh, just like asking a non-vegetarian which is the good food. So, <laughs> ask for non-vegetarian which is the good food. I think, uh, I think uh, it, all of his, uh, all of this has a different charm, you know. Um, and I, I, so, so it's not like a, if I ask you, uh, Ishika, what are the, tell me three good points. This is a very, very difficult, uh, right? choice yeah. because there are so many good points or so many good points i think the context when you are you have a different mood i think you will you'll go for a you you i think it's also depend on the mood also so if your mood is little bit sober so you may you may prefer certain certain kind of poetry uh, where you are mm-hmm. very very happy then you'll prefer certain a different kind of poetry and if you are uh, say sad you'll go for a different poetry i think it's it's similar uh, I don't think uh, I have a very favorite uh, one, but definitely primates are always, uh, always there. Apart from primate, uh, uh, I love teaching. So I, uh, I think uh, that's now uh, after five years, I can say li- with a little bit confidence that initially <laughs> I was a little bit apprehensive how, uh, what would, would, would I do justice to the post that was been offered to me, but uh, now I think I can be a little bit uh, confident that I can uh, at least teach. So, uh, as a researcher, I think I again uh, need to uh, say uh, start it uh, more. Uh, so, so, so then uh, if I if I go and start doing field work, then uh, I need to say also uh, compromise on teaching, which uh, I think uh, I need to think how to go. Uh, how, this is a trade-off. So how to, how much time I should spend on academia, how much I should, I should go into active research or say, engage with people. But I think uh, I, I'm just uh, taking it as a natural, uh, like, a, uh, so I'm not uh, thinking, uh, okay, I'll completely focus on this. So if de- uh, demands come tomorrow, Say tomorrow, I need to go and talk with uh, say PCCF. Maybe I, th- I, I think I'll uh, devote all my time going and talking to him, and uh, and I can adjust. I need to adjust other activities. Okay, so uh, but definitely uh, one thing is very clear. So Northeast, I think, is uh, my favorite, uh, particularly the Upper Assam, and primates are extremely f- f- like a favorite. And uh, slowly, what, what I also started doing is uh, the history, history. Uh, so not history, not in terms of, say, uh, our traditional history, but the history of ecology. So what I'm also trying to do uh, now is, uh, is to, when, when I'm teaching such, uh, certain things, so I wanted, I'll not go immediately into the, say, concept. For example, if I wanted to, teach say niche okay so niche has its own history so conservation biology has its own history right so i think if uh, so there I'm, I'm trying to develop this ecological pedagogy where uh, uh, i'm trying to bring the historical roots of all these issues so i think then it become very very interesting so no subject come into isolate uh, like uh, just come out of blue okay so everything has history so even even I think uh, the ecology there's a rich history. So I, I said that uh, we start with the natural science, natural history, and then come to say very very quantitative uh, ecology. And now I think we're in a m- much more like a modeling things like that. So if we can bring a particular subject into the historical context, the learning become very very interesting. So uh, so having said this, I'm I'm just trying to develop this how to teach ecology. So I think anybody can go and uh, uh, teach about certain concept, but how to teach? I think that's the very important thing, and I think it is there uh, where uh, um, um, this is the, like a new uh, kind of a new uh, area where I'm, I'm planning to explore more, uh, and uh, uh, yeah. So these are these are few things. Uh, the primate will continue. The teaching will continue. And uh, I think as a elephants, uh, one of my students is working on elephant right now. Uh, but uh, uh, I think I still prefer primates uh, than uh, so even even the birds and uh, 
know, butterflies and other things. But what I started appreciating, so I think uh, there are there are strong biases some some people, but I do not have that bias. So I have to, to to be frankly, so for example, if my student wanted to work on fish or say ant, I'll encourage them because I'll I'll also I'll also have to learn it. So so that is that is important. So if some if I'm not able to learn myself. So I learn from my student. So, so the the taxonomy, or say, or the behavior of say ant or something. So, uh, so this is the never-ending process. So I think our love for uh, wildlife and our love for nature should be there. I think everything is uh, secondary. So, uh, so recently I was telling someone that if you if you work on diatoms, so diatoms is amazing. So that day I I uh, heard heard a lecture. Uh, by Karthik, I think. Uh, so he talked about diatoms in the incredible work. So diatoms is such a fascinating system to uh, to uh, ask so many questions. Uh, so when this Bagjan blowout happened in Aparasa, right? Uh, so you must be aware of this uh, oil oil got uh, like caught fire. So we didn't uh, start thinking about elephants. We didn't think start thinking about tiger. I think what what are there? We start thinking about invertebrates. So I think our love for in invertebrates, are, are, are like odonates and the dragonflies, or say butterflies, or the earthworms. I think we need to go into that now slowly. I think uh, I, that's why I'm telling you that I have no bias towards this, but uh, definitely there are cert certain areas, and uh, if the if the situation demands, I'll go to go and study uh, maybe earthworm. Uh, because uh, if the blowout areas, right? So you cannot go and ask how it can impact a, a tiger. So I think we really need to come out of this tiger-centric uh, conservation or elephant-centric conservation or rhino-centric conservation and start, start appreciating nature. So I think the best uh, ecosystem services, I think earthworms are giving us, right? So in terms of, uh, if you look at the ecosystem services, so I think they are the they are the unsung heroes. So if someone wanted to work on earthworms, please go ahead and do it and do this. So uh, so this strong bias, though uh, I keep uh, talking about the primates because primates are like a. So I'm I'm I am married to primate, but the others are. So I'm just uh, different people, so my acquaintances. So I cannot leave that actually. <laughs> so. Yeah, thank you so much for that. And uh, we, I think we could go on talking about all of this. And you, right at the end now, you mentioned something that I think uh, will be increasingly important and so poorly explored, which is uh, ecological teaching pedagogy with an India focus, which I think uh, so many uh, universities will benefit uh, from something of that sort. And we definitely love to maybe have another episode with you sometime. But I think we'll have to come to a wrap now, on, uh, grudgingly, both of us. Uh, thank you so much for your time. But before we let you go, I think um, you mentioned right at the beginning that uh, when you were talking about your childhood and then moving into uh, behavioral ecology and primates, you said that after your uh, teacher who inspired you, then there were many other people who inspired you and brought you into this field. So uh, we'd like we'd like our listeners to also uh, hear who inspires our guests. So can you share some stories of your inspirations? Okay, uh, two people definitely uh, inspired. So, so definitely my teachers of uh, my you, school teachers. So I still fondly remember all of them uh, for pushing me, uh, like a Baburam Podel sir, long back, Dipesh Chetri, uh, uh, then Samse Thapa. So they, these were the people who taught me during my uh, schooling. Uh, then. Uh, definitely Dr. Anindya Sinha, no doubt about it, because he's there in thick and thin, uh, always there. I think whatever ecology I learned, I think I, a lot of this goes to, and whatever conservation biology I have learned, I think uh, that goes to Dr. M. Timon Madhusudan. So I think uh, I used to tell my student that, uh, I used to tell Madhu that uh, whenever I teach, I think a uh, lot of this conservation thing, um, particularly the solutions, problems, how to look at problems, how to, how to come out with a solution goes to 
say, uh, Dr. N.D. Madhusudan. I think he has a tremendous impact in me. Uh, the art part and the science part, definitely uh, Dr. T.R. Sankar Raman, um, uh, he's also a scientist at uh, uh, Nature Conservation Foundation. And I think I can keep go on and uh, on with uh, people whom uh, some point of time I used to uh, interact. The, the movies, uh, I think definitely uh, for Pavitra Sankaran. So I used to discuss a lot about movies, a lot about books uh, and many friends actually. I learned so much things from my friends, uh, like Umesh Srinivasan, Kulvushan, uh, then um, Dr. Rohit Nani Vadekar, Dr. Emo Anand. I think these are the people who, uh, so I think sometimes what happened, no, I think we need, we learn more uh, from a friend than from a mentor. Because, uh, and uh, this also Madhu also used to tell that, uh, I think more than the teachers, I think if you discuss with among yourself, you learn more. I think these are the people who really influence me. Um, and uh, I keep on going on telling so many people that came to my mind, uh, so uh, like known and unknown. And, and uh, many a times I think I learned from the people who are on the ground, okay? I learned from my, uh, say, uh, field guides. So they, they taught me like uh, the value of humanity, the value of simpleness, the value of empathy, actually. So some of them are completely like a, uh, there's no selfish motive behind helping me or helping certain causes. So I think there are a lot of people in Subhanka Chakravarti, so with whom I, I fight a lot. And uh, so we discuss range of topics. I think he's the, he's the one person uh, who, is, who hasn't uh, say disappointed me when, whenever I talk to him. And uh, there are certain people like a kind, kind of a Duronacharya. So I, I always uh, love Goteli. So I, I think uh, if, if he is hearing, hearing this, I think I'll, I just wanted to tell, thank, you, thank him for all the good books he has written. I think that's really shaping uh, uh, the kind of teaching that I'm doing it. Because it, so whenever you read Goteli, Goteli and uh, it's, it's like he's just on the top of you and telling you about these topics. <laughs> So I think it's, yeah. he has that immense uh, potential of say uh, writing uh, so that it's, it's become very, very like a visually very appealing. So otherwise it's very difficult to uh, read uh, or say explain this ecological model. So uh, yeah, these are the peoples and uh, uh, yeah, I think, I think also the landscape, landscape people and what, what also motivates me is that uh, whenever I see students, whenever uh, a teach, teacher who uh, who little bit uh, face difficulties, uh, I think they are also my inspiration to do more work. So that uh, there is a there is a need to uh, work in this landscape. There is a need to conserve this because nobody else will come and uh, say save the forest or save the monkeys of this region. It's a we I think us uh, in this area that needs to save these spaces or say protect this forest. So people will come, people will lend support, but ultimately it's, a, it's us that we need to take uh, the uh, say role of uh, the frontline uh, workers. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> this was uh, yeah, a long list of people who will, and hopefully uh, Mr. Cotelli will uh, tune in to our podcast and <laughs> write back to you. Thank you so much, Narayanda. This has been amazing. And I think, you know, you're a great person to learn from in terms of staying inspired and doing good work and still being so close to the crowd and you know, learn, still learning even after so many years. I think it's just wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much for talking to us. This has been uh, a wonderful recording. Thank you. And it was a great privilege as well. So. Thank you, Akshay. And uh, you guys also inspired me. Don't uh, only think that uh, I, uh, I'm a part of inspiration, but you, all of you are in, in inspiration in some way or others because all of you do good work and all of you have this heart. Uh, for the nature, uh, for to conserve work, and, and uh, uh, so what I what I really like is the new generations, uh, which are uh, which are, uh, do not have that uh, say ulterior motive or say very very career oriented. No, I think there are a lot of people who genuinely 
uh, concerned about our nature and uh, i think these are the people who ultimately save the future of the world so i'm i really looking forward uh, to all of you so all of your work and also wish you all the best for uh, future podcast and uh, all the listeners uh, of this podcast uh, so yeah thank you so much isika and uh, aksit We had a great time recording this episode and we hope you enjoyed it too. Thank you for listening.